Chapter 6. Discovery. Key Exam Issues. Broad discovery is a relatively recent addition to American litigation. The justification for allowing broad discovery is to afford parties an opportunity to obtain full information to support their own cases and information about what evidence other parties will use to support their cases. Balanced against the interest in fostering a candid exchange of information is the risk of serious costs, either due to invasion of privacy or other confidentiality issues or due to the simple expense of responding to discovery requests. When presented with an examination question involving discovery issues, the following approach should be useful. 1. What exactly is sought in the discovery request? Discovery requests must specify what is sought and the party seeking discovery must use a mode of discovery suited to obtaining the desired information. On an exam, seemingly innocuous discovery requests may turn out to be overbroad or to seek information not available using the discovery method employed. It is important at the outset to appreciate the breadth of the discovery demand and to focus on the specific operation of the various discovery devices. A. Initial Disclosure in federal court, the parties must exchange certain basic information before formal discovery begins. This exchange following a discovery conference should include the identities of likely witnesses the disclosing party will use, identification of documents the disclosing party will use, details about damage claims made by the disclosing party, and information about insurance that may cover the disclosing party's liability in the litigation. B. Document Production Discovery often begins with document production to obtain materials that may be used later to question witnesses. These requests can include electronically stored information and often are objected to as unduly burdensome. A document request, unlike an interrogatory, cannot generally require a party to create responsive materials. But document requests can be very useful documents don't forget. And recall that with a subpoena, a party can obtain document production by a non-party. C. Interrogatories. Interrogatories are written questions that must be answered in writing by a party under oath, and a reasonable investigation is required to obtain the requested information. If the answers are from the responding party's records, and the effort involved in obtaining the information is roughly equal for the requesting and responding party, the responding party is permitted to make the records available for review by the party seeking discovery. Interrogatories cannot be sent to non-parties. d. Depositions Depositions involve live questioning under oath by the lawyer who requested the deposition. Unlike interrogatories, this means that the lawyer can follow up responses to obtain more information. The witness is usually represented by a lawyer who can object to questions. The testimony is recorded and may be used as evidence at trial. During the deposition, a lawyer may show documents to the witness and ask questions about them. Using a subpoena, a party may compel a non-party to submit to a deposition. e. Physical or mental examinations. By court order, a party may have another party examined by a suitably credentialed expert if the physical or mental condition of the person is in issue. There is no procedure for obtaining such an examination of a non-party. f. Requests for admissions. These devices resemble pleadings in that they are not to discover new information, but to establish facts. Unless the recipient party denies the requests, they are deemed admitted for purposes of this litigation. Although under some circumstances a party who has made an admission will be permitted to withdraw it with an adequate explanation. g. Supplementation. With most disclosure and discovery, there is a duty to supplement after the initial discovery responses are provided, if those responses were incomplete or inaccurate. 2. Is the information sought relevant? The basic standard for discovery is whether the information sought is relevant. This standard calls for consideration of the issues raised by the pleadings. Any information that might reasonably prove or disprove those issues is relevant. The scope of relevance is very broad, including information that bears on the credibility of probable witnesses or on the extent of injuries for which compensation is sought. 
In this common sense determination, creativity in developing grounds for relevance is often rewarded. 3. Would the discovery involve undue burden or expense? In federal court, the judge is to limit discovery that imposes costs on the responding party that are disproportionate to the importance of obtaining the information for use in the case. The starting assumption is that the responding party must shoulder the expense of responding. But if he can show that the information sought is of marginal relevance to the case, or that he has already produced sufficient information on the issue, he may be able to persuade the judge that further discovery is not warranted due to the expense involved. The burden is on the objecting party to establish that burden, and the court may enter a protective order, if so persuaded. 4. Is the information sought protected by a privilege? Even though otherwise relevant, information that is protected by a privilege is not discoverable. The most common privilege objection is based on the attorney-client privilege, which depends on whether the information is about a communication between a client and an attorney relating to legal advice that was made in confidence. If others have become aware of the communication, there may be a ground for arguing that the privilege protection has been waived. 5. Is the information protected as work product? Information developed in anticipation of litigation is conditionally protected against discovery. In order to discover such information, a party must demonstrate that it has a substantial need for the information and that it is unable to obtain the substantial equivalent. Even if it orders production, the court should protect against revelation of opinion work product. 6. Does the discovery seek information developed by experts? When information is developed for use in litigation by experts retained by the parties, special discovery provisions apply. a. Testifying expert witnesses. If the expert will be testifying at trial, the retaining party must provide disclosure identifying the expert before trial, and the expert usually must supply a detailed report concerning the testimony, including all data or information she considered in relation to the opinion. The other side may then take the deposition of the expert witness. b. Non-testifying expert consultant. When a party retains an expert to assist in the preparation of the case, but not to testify. Discovery about the information developed by the expert is allowed only in exceptional circumstances, such as when the expert is the only one to have observed certain events, or when there are no more experts available. 7. Can a party obtain an order compelling discovery or imposing sanctions? A party that believes another party has not properly responded to its discovery may move for an order compelling discovery. If the court orders the discovery, but the other party does not obey the order, it is possible to obtain sanctions, including dismissal or default, for that disobedience. The party seeking an order must show that the discovery response was inadequate and, for sanctions, that the court's order was disobeyed. 8. May discovery material be used at trial? In general, material obtained through discovery may be used at trial. A. Depositions. Ordinarily, a deposition may be used at trial in lieu of live witness testimony only if the witness is an opposing party or has been shown to be unavailable. b. Undisclosed information. When a party tries to use information, it should have included in automatic disclosure or in response to discovery. The court on objection should exclude the information unless the failure to disclose it was harmless or was substantially justified. Exclusion should occur on motions as well as at trial. c. Governed by the rules of evidence. In general, the admissibility of discovery information at trial depends on the applicable rules of evidence. c. Evidence summary. a. Introduction. 1. History of discovery. a. Common Law 1331. Under Common Law Procedure, the pleadings were to disclose factual contentions and information to the adversary parties. Neither party could compel the other to disclose additional information that might support his case, even such crucial information as the identity of an eyewitness. A party was not compelled to reveal in advance the evidence he would present at trial. 
Neither were third parties required to make disclosures, except pursuant to a subpoena requiring their attendance at trial. B. Equity 1332. In early equity practice, a bill in equity could be used to compel the adversary to disclose information, and such bills frequently were accompanied by interrogatories which the defendant was required to answer under oath. In addition, parties or witnesses could be required to appear for depositions where interrogation through written questions could be conducted. Since answers to interrogatories and depositions were a part of the record on which the decision was made, they were really part of the trial and not merely preparatory discovery. Live testimony was usually not allowed at the hearing, so cases were decided on the basis of the material developed through discovery. C. Equity in Aid of Law, 1333. A litigant in a law court could sometimes take advantage of the equitable procedures by bringing a bill in equity to compel discovery of information needed to present a claim or defense at law. Such a bill could issue if the evidence sought would be admissible in the specific legal proceeding i.e. if the moving party was not embarked on a fishing expedition and would be helpful to the moving party in meeting a burden of proof imposed on him. D. Code Procedure 1 on 334 19th century reforms merged the Bill of Discovery into legal proceedings, but did not significantly enlarge its availability. Thus, heavy reliance on the pleadings continued. e. Federal Rules 1 on 335 Ultimately, the federal rules made pretrial discovery an integral part of the process of defining the issues for trial. Similar discovery procedures have now been adopted in almost every state. However, increasing concern about excessive discovery has led to repeated revision of discovery rules. 2. Purpose and Effect of Discovery Procedures a. Obtaining Factual Information 1 in 336 A party who has made effective use of discovery can go to trial with the best evidence available to prove his contentions and with a good knowledge of the presentation that his adversary will make. Surprise and delay are thus largely avoided, and the chance that the judgment will rest on accurate findings of fact is enhanced. b. Narrowing the issues 1 in 337. Discovery can help to eliminate fictitious issues, claims, or defenses by revealing overwhelming evidence on one side thereby paving the way for stipulations, settlements, and summary disposition. CAUTION Many lawyers say that broad discovery has not in fact narrowed cases, although it may have facilitated summary judgment C. Infra, 1 in 684 at SEC. C. Promoting settlements 1 in 338. It was hoped that discovery would facilitate more and earlier settlements by providing each side fuller knowledge of the strengths and weaknesses of its case. d. Simplification of pleading 1 thing 339. The availability of discovery makes it unnecessary to rely heavily upon the pleadings for exchanging information, narrowing issues, or disposing of untenable claims or defenses. Accordingly, where discovery is available, pleading is simplified and technical challenges to pleadings are disfavored. E. Costs to litigants wanting 340. To the extent that discovery produces settlements and stipulations, it can substantially cut down costs to one or both parties. At the same time, the discovery process itself can be very costly in terms of time spent by lawyers, parties, witnesses, and court reporters. F. Substantive consequences wanting 341. The foregoing effects of discovery can have substantive implications as well. Claims and defenses otherwise difficult to establish may be made effective by the availability of discovery. Antitrust claims, for example, are often proved with evidence discovered in the possession of the defense. And the availability of discovery may enable a tenacious and resourceful litigant to wear down one who is weaker or less energetic. 3. Problems in Discovery a. Collateral Purpose Problem, 1 in 342. An ongoing concern with discovery is the risk that litigants may seek to obtain discovery for some purpose other than preparation for trial. 1. Harassment, 1 in 343. Because of its cost, discovery can be used to harass an opponent 
or club an opponent into settlement. The court has power to limit discovery, having these tendencies fed. R. Civ. P. 26 B. 2. And to sanction the person who misuses it fed. R. Civ. P. 26 G. 2. Non-litigation use of information 1 in 344. Alternatively, a litigant may seek information that is pertinent to the litigation to use it for some non-litigation purpose. Example. In litigation between business competitors, one litigant may seek to force its opponent to reveal information that can be used to obtain competitive advantages in the marketplace. Example. In an action between Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis and a professional photographer who specialized in unauthorized candid photos of the Kennedy family, there was concern that the photographer would use Ms. Onassis's deposition as an occasion for photographing her. Galila V. Onassis, 487F2D986-2D Sir, 1974 Upholding Protective Order Excluding Plaintiff from Defendant's Deposition. B. Stonewalling and Failure to Respond Properly Wanting 345. Another prominent discovery concern is that some litigants do not comply with their obligations to respond to discovery in a timely or thorough manner. Some reportedly withhold materials that should be turned over, while others may use dump truck tactics turning over vast amounts of irrelevant material that the opponent must sift through rather than only the items requested. B. Basic Discovery Devices 1. Prediscovery Disclosure 1 in 346 Federal Rule 26 A1 provides for disclosure of certain information before commencement of formal discovery. Rationale. Formal discovery is too time-consuming and expensive as to certain core information that will undoubtedly be revealed during the formal discovery process. A. Early Conference of Council 1 347. To accomplish the objectives of the disclosure provisions, counsel are to meet and confer as soon as practicable after the suit is filed. The purpose of this conference is to allow the parties to discuss the nature and basis of their claims and defenses, to discuss any issues about preserving discoverable information, and to develop a proposed discovery plan, as well as to specify the materials that should be included in the pre-discovery disclosures. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26 F. 2. 1. Presented to Court 1 in 348. The discovery plan is to be presented to the court in writing within 14 days or orally at the court's scheduling conference pursuant to Rule 16c infra 1 in 760 1 in 765. b. No formal discovery until meeting of counsel 1 in 349. Formal discovery may not be undertaken, except on stipulation or court order, until the Rule 26f conference has been completed. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26d1. 1. Exception for witnesses leaving country 1 in 350. A party may take a deposition earlier if the witness is expected to leave the country and be unavailable for deposition in this country unless examined before the meeting of counsel. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30a2a. C. Disclosure of materials disclosing party may use 1 thing 351. Prediscovery disclosure is required regarding witnesses and documents that the disclosing party may use to support its claims or defenses. 1. Impeachment materials excluded 1 thing 352. Materials that a party would use solely for impeachment are not subject to the disclosure requirement. Caution. Very few materials fall within this category. If they are relevant for some purpose other than impeachment, a court may hold this exemption inapplicable. 2. Categories of cases exempted 1 353. A limited number of categories of cases in which substantial discovery is unlikely are exempted from the disclosure requirement and the accompanying attorney conference and discovery moratorium provisions. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26A1B examples include habeas corpus petitions, actions to enforce an administrative subpoena, 
and actions on guaranteed student loans. 3. Objection suspends duty to disclose 1D354. If a party objects during the Rule 26F attorney conference that disclosure is not appropriate in this action, and states that objection in the Rule 26F report to the Court C. Supra, 1E348, the obligation to disclose is suspended until the Court rules on the objection. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26A1D. 4. Disclosure by later added parties 1E355. A party first served or otherwise joined after the Rule 26F conference must make its disclosures within 30 days. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26A1D. D. Material to be disclosed. 1. Identity of witnesses 1 in 356. Each party is to disclose the name and, if known, the address and telephone number of each person whom it may use to support its claims or defenses. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26A1AI. 2. Documents that may be used 1 in 357. Each party is to disclose a copy or description by category of all documents in its possession that it may use to support its claims or defenses. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26A1I. A. Broad concept of use. The expected use of a document or witness that mandates disclosure is not limited to use at trial. The expectation that a document or witness will be used in connection with any motion or a pretrial conference is sufficient. Sufficient use even includes certain discovery events, such as questioning a witness by using a document. However, the concept of use here does not extend to the mere use of a document or witness's name to respond to another party's discovery inquiry. 3. Damages Computation 1 in 358 Each party claiming damages should disclose a computation of those damages and produce the documents on which the computation is based. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26A1II. 4. Insurance Agreements 1E359. Each party against whom a claim has been asserted should produce for inspection, and copying each insurance agreement that might cover the claim. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26A1A. E. Timing of Disclosures 1360. These disclosures should be made at, or within 14 days after, the meeting of counsel pursuant to Rule 26F Supra, 1347, unless otherwise agreed by the parties or ordered by the court. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26A1C Note. A different period applies to later added parties. C. Supra, 1355. F. Form of Disclosures 1E361 Every disclosure is to be signed by at least one attorney of record for the disclosing party. The signature represents that to the best of the lawyer's knowledge, formed after a reasonable inquiry, the disclosure is complete and correct as of the time it is made. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26G1A. G. Duty to Supplement 1E362 if a party learns that its disclosures were incorrect, or if additional or corrective information comes to its attention, the party is to supplement the disclosure with the added information. Fed. R. Sif. P. 26E1A. H. Sanctions for failure to disclose 1E363. A party failing to disclose as required by Rule 26A1 or to supplement as required by Rule 26E1 is subject to sanctions. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37C1. 1. Exclusion of Evidence 1E364. Unless the failure to disclose was harmless, the party will not be permitted to use the material in evidence. This sanction is said to be automatic, and it applies not only at trial, but also at motion hearings as on a motion for summary judgment. 2. Additional Sanctions 1E365 In addition, the court may impose the sanctions authorized by Rule 37b, which usually require an order compelling discovery as a prerequisite see infra, 
one in 634, one in 639, and can inform the jury of the failure to make disclosure. I. Stipulation to limit disclosure obligation, one in 366. The parties may stipulate to limit or alter the initial disclosure obligation. 2. Depositions 1 in 367. A deposition is an examination of a witness under oath in the presence of a court reporter. All parties have a right to be represented by counsel at a deposition, and counsel may examine and cross-examine the witness. The examination may be held in the presence of a judge if the witness is recalcitrant. A. When timely. 1. Before suit filed 1 in 368. A deposition may be taken before an action is filed, or while an appeal is pending from a final judgment, but only by leave of court granted for the purpose of perpetuating testimony based on a showing that the party seeking to perpetuate testimony is unable to cause the action to be brought. Fed. R. Civ. P. 27A. 2. Moratorium after commencement of suit 1369. Federal Rule 26D1 provides that formal discovery except depositions of witnesses about to leave the country. C. Supra, 1E3 at 50 must be deferred until after the parties meet and confer on a discovery plan pursuant to Rule 26F. A. Defendant's Head Start. Where the moratorium does not apply, as in state court, defendants usually are protected against initiation of formal discovery by the plaintiff until a certain time after service of the complaint e.g. Cal. Code Civ. Proc. 25-2010-B 20-day period for noticing depositions. 3. Simultaneous Proceedings 1D-370 All parties may take depositions simultaneously unless the court otherwise directs. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26-D-2 Hence. Neither side is entitled to discovery priority before the other side can commence discovery. b. Optional to parties 1 in 371. Depositions are optional. Each party has the right to take the deposition of any witness without a showing of good cause, but is not required to do so. A party is also entitled to interview any willing non-party witness without court supervision. Corley v. Rosewood Care Center, Inc. 142 F3D 1 in 41 7th Sir. 1998. C. Numerical cap on depositions 1 in 372. To curb abuse, Rule 30 imposes a 10 deposition limit. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30A to AI. 1. Limit per side 1 in 373. The 10 deposition limit is not per party, but rather is calculated cumulatively for plaintiffs, defendants, and third party defendants. 2. One deposition per witness 1 in 374. In addition, the rules provide that a given witness's deposition may be taken only once. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30A to I. 3. Change by stipulation or order 1 in 375. The parties may stipulate in writing to vary the deposition limitation, and the court may so order. D. Durational limit on depositions, 1 in 376. Due to concerns that some depositions may be too long, depositions in federal court are limited to one seven-hour day. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30D1 Some states have tighter time limits. E. Compulsory appearance of witness. 1. Issuance of subpoena 1 in 377. At the request of a party, the court clerk will issue a subpoena commanding the named witness to appear and give testimony at the designated time and place. An attorney admitted to practice before the court may also issue a subpoena. Fed. R. Civ. P. 45A3. 2. Service of subpoena 1D378. A subpoena is served on the witness personally and must be accompanied by a tender of the fee for one day's attendance plus reimbursement for mileage. Fed. R. Civ. P. 45 B1. 3. Place of deposition 1 in 379. 
A witness may be required to appear at a deposition at any place within 100 miles of the place where he resides, is employed, or transacts business. Fed. R. Civ. P. 45C3I. Compare Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 225 to 50 A75 miles. 4. Subpoena not necessary for party witness 1 in 380. It is not necessary to serve a subpoena on an adverse party or an officer or managing agent of a party in order to compel attendance. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37D1AI. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2052080 80 a, a deposition of a party witness may be scheduled at any reasonable place. 5. Deposition of corporation or organization. 1 in 381. Where a corporation or an association or governmental body is to be deposed, the party taking the deposition need not identify the individual who is compelled to give the deposition. She needs state only the matters on which she proposes to examine the organization, and the organization must then designate the appropriate witness. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30B6 The adversary need not guess which employee is in possession of the required information, and the organization itself is bound by its deponent's answers. A. Scope of Inquiry 1 in 382 Problems can arise when the party doing discovery inquires into matters relevant to the suit, but beyond the expertise of the witness or beyond the matters specified in the notice. If the witness has some knowledge of the matters, she may have to answer, and the organization may be bound by her testimony. Example. Where a defendant manufacturer designated a doctor as its witness in a product's liability action, the doctor could be required to answer questions about company policy as well as technical matters on which he had expertise. Lapina v. Upjohn Co. 110 FRD. 15 ED. PA. 1986. F. Notice to Parties. 1. Form of Notice 1383. A party wishing to depose a witness must give written notice to every other party, identifying the deponent and the time and place of the deposition. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30B1. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2025 2. Time for Notice 1384. In federal proceedings, Notice must be given a reasonable length of time in advance of the scheduled date for the deposition. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30B1 Some state codes are more explicit in regard to the time period. C. E.G. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 225 a 10 days. G. Production of documents 1385. The subpoena when necessary or the notice may direct the witness to bring along and produce at the deposition any documents that could properly be sought by a request for production of documents C and FRA. 1442-1468. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30B2. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2025 2 1. Effect on timing 1 in 386 where the witness is to produce documents at the deposition, more notice is required. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30B2 time required for Rule 34 document production. 30 days. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2025 a 20 days. H. Questioning of deponent. 1. Oral 1387. Ordinarily, the examination of deponents is conducted orally, with the examining party questioning first, and the others in turn. A. Examination by witnesses attorney 1 in 388. Usually the attorney for the witness will not question the witness except to clear up important matters left uncertain by other interrogation. Rationale. The witness's lawyer does not wish to assist the other parties by making the content of the witness's testimony at trial more evident to them than their own questions have made it. 2. Depositions in Writing 1 in 389 The examining party may choose to conduct the examination in writing. If so, the questions are submitted in writing. 
the adversary may review the questions in advance and submit cross-questions to be answered at the same time. And the cross-questions may be followed by redirect and recross questions Even though the questions are written, the answers of the deponent are given orally. Fed. R. Civ. P. 31. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2020-8010. A. Practicality 1 in 390. This form of deposition may be more economical because it does not require the attendance of lawyers at the place of the deposition. On the other hand, it does not give the examiner an opportunity to follow up answers effectively, and hence is not used where the witness may be evasive or where the subject under examination is complex. 3. Depositions by Telephone 1 in 391 In federal practice, the deposition may be taken by telephone upon leave of court, or if both parties so stipulate in writing. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30b4. 4. Objections to Questions 1 in 392. The lawyer for the witness may object to a question and instruct the witness not to answer. a. Limitation on instructions not to answer 1 in 393. In federal court, a witness may be instructed not to answer a question only to preserve a privilege see infra 1 in 509 1 in 545 to enforce a limitation on evidence imposed by the court in the case, or to present a motion for a protective order. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30 C. 2. Furthermore, some federal courts have imposed stricter restraints on the behavior of the lawyer for the witness. C. E.G. Hall v. Clifton Precision. 150 F.R.D. 525 E.D. Pa. 1993 Deponent's Attorney Forbidden to Talk to Deponent Between Commencement and Completion of Deposition, Except to Decide Whether to Assert a Privilege. b. Motion to Compel 1394. When a witness is instructed not to answer, the examining party may move for an order of the court compelling an answer. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37A3BI. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 225-480-A. C. Failure to obey Order 1 in 395. If the witness disobeys an order to answer, the witness may be held in contempt, and a party witness may be subject to other sanctions as well. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37B. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 225-480-G. D. Protective order for witness 1 in 396. On the other hand, if questioning is conducted in an unreasonably oppressive manner, the witness may move for a protective order limiting or terminating the examination. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30 D. 3. E. No waiver 1 in 397. Failure of the witness to object to a question on deposition does not constitute a waiver of her right to object to the same question or answer at trial. Fed. R. Civ. P. 32A1B. 32B. 1. Exception matters of Form 1 in 398. Errors in the taking of a deposition that might be cured if promptly presented, but which were not, may not be raised as grounds for exclusion of the deposition evidence at trial. This includes objections to the form of questions or answers, or in the manner of taking of the deposition. Fed. R. Civ. P. 32 D. 3 B. I. Transcription of Deposition. 1. Review of Transcript 1 in 399. If requested before completion of the deposition, a deponent is entitled to review the transcript of her testimony and make corrections in it subject to the right of the examining party to comment on the changes, if the deposition is used at trial. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30 E. 1. 2. Videotape 1 theme 400. In federal practice, a deposition may be recorded by audio, audiovisual, or stenographic means if the party noticing the deposition so chooses. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30b3 Some states also permit a videotape deposition. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 225510 510 f J. Use of deposition testimony at trial. 
1. Generally inadmissible wanting 401. Statements and depositions are hearsay, and thus are generally inadmissible at trial to prove the truth of matters asserted by deponents. 2. Exceptions wanting 402. In the following circumstances, however, statements made in depositions may be admissible. a. Party admissions wanting 403. Deposition statements by party witnesses are admissible against those parties. Fed. R. Civ. P. 32A3. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 225 620B. b. Impeachment wanting 404. A deposition by a non-party witness that contradicts testimony given at trial by that witness may be admitted for the purpose of impeaching the witness who has changed her story. Fed. R. Civ. P. 32A2. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 225 620A. C. Unavailability of deponent 1T4 to 5. If the deponent is dead, infirm, imprisoned, or beyond the reach of subpoena process at the time of trial, the deposition may be used in lieu of her live testimony. Fed. R. Civ. P. 32A4. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code. 225 620C2. 1. Note. This rule also applies to the deposition of a party seeking to use his own deposition, instead of testifying at trial, unless that party is responsible for his own absence. Richmond v. Brooks, 227F2D 492D Sir, 1955. 3. Objectionable evidence in deposition, 1 all 406. A party may object to the admission of deposition testimony on any ground that would be available if the witness were testifying in person. This is true even if the objection was not raised at the time the deposition was taken, except as to matters of form. Fed. R. Civ. P. 32B. D3. 3. Interrogatories 1E407. Interrogatories are written questions from one party to another party requiring written responses. Fed. R. Civ. P. 33A. Cow. Civ. Proc. Code 203010. A. Distinguish depositions 1 in 408. Be sure to distinguish interrogatories from depositions. 1. Depositions can be taken from a party or non party witness while interrogatories may be addressed only to a party to the action. 2. Deposition questions may be oral or written, but the answers are always given orally before a court reporter or similar official who transcribes what is said, or videotaped or audiotaped. In contrast, answers to written interrogatories are prepared in writing, usually by counsel for the answering party. 3. A deponent may limit her answers to matters of which she has personal knowledge. Interrogatories require the party to answer not only of her own knowledge, but also on the basis of information to which she has reasonable access. b. Who must answer. 1. Any other party wanting 409. A non-party witness is not subject to interrogatories. 2. Co-parties wanting 410. Co-parties generally are obliged to respond to interrogatories, although a few states adhere to an older rule that interrogatories may be served only upon an adverse party. 3. Corporate Parties 1 in 411 Interrogatories served on a corporation may be answered by any officer or agent designated by the corporation. Fed. R. Civ. P. 33B1B. C. When served. 1. Federal Practice 1E412 In federal practice, interrogatories, like other formal discovery, may be served only after the Rule 26F conference on a discovery plan. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26D1 2. State Practice 1E4-13 Some state rules require the plaintiff to delay service of interrogatories for a fixed period following service of the complaint. C. E.G. Cal. Sif. Proc. Code 2030 20 B. 10 days. D. Numerical limit 1T414. 
In federal practice parties are limited to 25 interrogatories, including subparts. Fed. R. Civ. P. 33A1 This limitation applies to each party, so that co-parties such as co-plaintiffs may each use 25 interrogatories, even though represented by the same lawyer. The limit may be varied by stipulation or court order. Some states have similar numerical limitations. C. E.G. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2030 A135 Interrogatories. E. Duty to Respond. 1. Time for Response 1415. A party must answer or object to interrogatories within 30 days after their date of service. Fed. R. Civ. P. 33B2. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2032-60A. 2. Duty to investigate 1D416. A party to whom interrogatories are propounded must give all information responsive to the questions that is under her control. This generally includes all information that might be discovered in her own files or by further questioning of her agents or employees. 3. Option where extensive search required 1D4-17. If an answer can be supplied only by extensive search of the responding party's records and the burden of ascertaining the information is substantially the same for the inquiring and responding parties, the responding party may specify the pertinent records and allow the inquiring party to examine and copy them. Fed. R. Civ. P. 33D. And C. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 203230. F. Failure to make adequate response to interrogatories. 1. Motion to compel response 18418. If an answer to interrogatories is incomplete or evasive, on motion the court will order the responding party to answer fully. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37A. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 203300 Al. If the responding party does not obey the order, she is subject to sanctions. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37B2. 2. Time for Motion 1419. In federal proceedings, a motion to compel an answer may be made at any time. Under state rules, the motion may have to be made promptly after receipt of the unsatisfactory answer, or the matter will be deemed waived. C. E.G. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2033 to C 45 days after response served. 3. Objections to interrogatories 1 E 4 to 20. A motion to compel an answer to an interrogatory will be denied if the question propounded is subject to a valid and timely objection. 4. Costs of proceedings 1 E 4 to 21. A party moving to compel an answer without substantial justification, therefore, or a party making an objection that lacks substantiality, is subject to an award to the adversary of costs, including attorney's fees incurred in the discovery dispute. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37A5A. 4. Requests for admission. A. Device to eliminate issues 1 in 4 to 22. A request for an admission imposes a duty on the party served to acknowledge the existence of facts that are not in doubt and that should not be necessary to prove at trial. Fed. R. Civ. P. 36A. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2033 B. On whom served 1423. A request for admission may be served by any party on any other party, whether or not adverse. Fed. R. Civ. P. 36A1. C. Subject of request. 1. Facts or application of law to fact 24 and 24. A request may ask the party served to admit the genuineness of a document, the truth of factual allegations, or the applicability of legal concepts to specified facts in issue. 2. Conclusions of law 24 to 25. A party may request another party to make an admission about the circumstances underlying the case that includes a legal conclusion e.g. that a person was acting as an agent, or that the speed limit at a point of impact was 50 miles per hour. A. But note. 
It is not proper to request an admission to an abstract statement of law e.g. that speeding constitutes negligence. Fed. R. Civ. P. 36A1. 3. Ultimate Issues 24-26 Under the federal rules, a party may be requested to admit an ultimate fact i.e. one that controls the outcome of the controversy such as causation. Fed. R. Civ. P. 36 a 1 a not all states adhere to this rule. However, 4. Opinions 24 to 27. A party may also request another party to make an admission regarding a matter of opinion, such as the value of property or the extent of damages. A request is not improper merely because the matter to be admitted is in controversy or in doubt. 5. Matters unknown to responding party 1 in 4 28. A party may also be requested to admit a fact that is outside his knowledge. D. Time limits. 1. For serving requests 1E4-29. Under the federal rules, a request to admit may be served at any time after the Rule 26F conference. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26D1 in some states. Leave of court is required if the plaintiff wishes to serve requests within 10 days after service of process. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 203320 b 2. For responses 1T430. The party upon whom a request is served must file a response within 30 days. Fed. R. Civ. P. 36A3. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2033-250. E. Appropriate Responses. 1. Admit 1T431. The responding party may choose to make the requested admission. And if he does so, he will not be permitted to controvert the admission at trial. But the admission is binding only in the present action. It may not be used against the party in any other proceeding. Fed. R. Civ. P. 36b. 2. Deny 1D432. If the responding party chooses to deny the matter that he is asked to admit, and the matter is subsequently proved, the party may be liable for the full costs of proving that matter, unless the court finds that there were good reasons for the denial, or that the admissions sought were of no substantial importance. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37c2. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2033 20. A. Impact 1433. The matter of an award of costs is generally within the court's discretion. The court's power to impose sanctions is not affected by which party ultimately wins the lawsuit. Even the winner may end up having to pay sanctions to the loser if the winner was guilty of a bad faith refusal to admit necessitating extra expenses of proof by the loser. Smith v. Circle P Ranch Co. 87 Cal. App. 3D 267 1978. B. Equivocal denial 1 in 434. An equivocal denial e.g. Defendant is not presently certain. Or, plaintiff reserves the right to contest this assertion, may be treated as an admission or on motion. The court may order a proper response. Alternatively, the court might treat an equivocal denial as a false denial above and award the full costs of proof to the requesting party. 3. Reasons for not admitting or denying 1435. If the responding party has good reasons for objecting to the request, she may decline to admit or deny and instead must state her refusal and the grounds therefore. However, there are few valid objections to be made. A. Nature of matter sought to be admitted 1436. That the matter is one of opinion, or an ultimate issue, or a conclusion of law, is not an adequate reason for refusing to admit or deny. B. Ignorance of matter sought to be admitted 1437. However, it is sufficient for a refusal to admit that the responding party is ignorant of the matter in question, provided she has made reasonable inquiry and still found the information unavailable. c. Self-incrimination 1438. A party can refuse to answer on the ground 
that her response may tend to incriminate herself. D. Consequences of giving insufficient reasons, 1 439. The party seeking the admission may move to determine the sufficiency of any objections to his request. If the reasons are insufficient, the court may order a proper response and may impose other sanctions on the party, making the inadequate response. Even if no such motion is made, the party making the request may prove the matter, in which event the court can order the objecting party to pay the full costs of proof. 4. Failure to respond 1440. If there is no timely response to a request, the matter is deemed admitted. Fed. R. Civ. P. 36A3. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2033-280B. F. Withdrawal of admissions 1-4-41. If presentation of the merits will be served, the court may allow a party to amend or withdraw an admission previously made. Fed. R. Civ. P. 36B. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2033-300. 5. Requests for inspection of documents and other things. A. Materials discoverable 1442. A party is entitled to obtain production of a variety of items in the possession or control of another party fed. R. Civ. P. 34A. 1. Documents 1 in 443. A request for production may seek writings, drawings, graphs, charts, or any other documentary information. 2. Electronically stored information 1 in 444. Electronically stored information, including data or data compilations, images, or recordings may be obtained by request. 3. Tangible things 1445. Tangible things, such as an automobile, are also subject to discovery under Rule 34. b. Scope of examination 1446. Examination may include testing and sampling of materials and may involve an entry onto the property of a party. With electronically stored information, this may sometimes involve access to an opposing party's electronic information system. C. Making request for inspection. 1. No court action required 1447. The party seeking discovery may serve a request for inspection without prior court order or a showing of good cause. A. Inspection of premises 1448. When inspection of premises is sought, a general showing of relevancy may not be enough since entry upon one's premises may entail greater burdens and risks than mere production of documents or other physical evidence. Some degree of necessity is generally required for such inspection. Belcher v. Bassett Furniture, 588 F2D 904 4th Sir, 1978. 2. Timing 1449. Under the federal rules, a request for inspection may be served at any time after the Rule 26F conference. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26D1. 34. Some state rules require leave of court if the request is served concurrently with the initial pleadings. C. E.G. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 203120 C. Leave of court required if request served by plaintiff within 10 days after service of summons. D. Designation of items 1 in 450. The moving party must describe the items to be produced with sufficient certainty to enable a person of ordinary intelligence to know which items are sought. Fed. R. Civ. P. 34B. One other forms of discovery are sometimes needed to identify the real evidence to be inspected. 1. Designation by category 1 in 451. Often a party will request all materials that fall within a category e.g., all documents that relate or refer to the meeting on January 1, 27, rather than specifying individual items. This is done because the party requesting production cannot know for certain what materials the responding party possesses and wishes to avoid omitting valuable information. 2. Relation to Initial Disclosures 1 in 452 the initial disclosures pursuant to Rule 26 A1 C Supra, 
1 in 357 may enable the requesting party to be more specific in the document request. E. Timing of inspection. 1 in 453. The request for inspection must specify the proposed time, place, and manner of making the inspection. Fed. R. Civ. P. 34B2A. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 203103 c Form for Producing Electronically Stored Information, 1T454. The request may specify the form or forms in which the party wishes electronically stored information to be produced. Fed. R. Civ. P. 34B1C. 1. When request does not designate Form 1T455. If the request does not designate the form for producing electronically stored information. The responding party may choose between a form in which he maintains the information and a form that is reasonably usable to the party seeking production. Fed. R. Civ. P. 34B2E. 2. Objecting to designated form 1456. When the request designates a form for producing electronically stored information, the responding party may object to using the designated form. Fed. R. Civ. P. 34B2D. 3. Stating form producing party will use 1457. Whether or not the request specifies a form for production of electronically stored information, the responding party must specify in his response to the request the form he intends to use for production. Fed. R. Civ. P. 34B2D. G. Objection to requests. 1. Timing 1T458. In federal actions, the party receiving a request for inspection may file written objections within 30 days following service of the request. Fed. R. Civ. P. 34B2A. Compare Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2031 260 20 days. 2. Motion with respect to objections 1T459. If objections are made, the requesting party may move for an order compelling the requested inspection, and the merits of the objections will then be determined by the court. H. Items in responding parties control 1460. The responding party is to produce all requested items unless objections are interposed that are within its possession, custody, or control. Some courts hold that the control idea requires the responding party to make efforts to obtain documents from others if it has influence over the possessor. C. E.G. Cooper Industries, Inc. v. British Aerospace, Inc. 102 FRD, 1918 SDNY, 1984. I. Inaccessible Electronically Stored Information, 1461. Electronically stored information need not be produced if the responding party identifies it as from a source that is not reasonably accessible because of undue burden or cost. On motion to compel discovery or for a protective order, that party must show to the court's satisfaction that the information from this source is not reasonably accessible. Even then, the court may order the information produced for good cause but it may also impose conditions such as cost shifting or cost sharing. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26B2B. J. Organization of Produced Materials 1D462. In federal court, and in some state courts, the responding party is required to produce the requested materials either as they are kept in the ordinary course of business or organized and labeled to correspond to the requests. Fed. R. Civ. P. 34B2E. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2031 80 a 1. Stimulus for Requirement 1 in 463. This requirement was included to prevent responding parties from hiding embarrassing materials among mounds of uninteresting materials e.g. placing an inculpatory memorandum among thousands of invoices instead of leaving it in the memorandum file where it is normally kept. A. Ethical requirements. Hiding relevant material as described above is probably a violation of a lawyer's ethical responsibilities.
even if it were permitted by the discovery rules. See Legal Ethics Summary. 2. Course of Business Format, usually employed for documents 1E464. Most responding parties will produce records in the way they are kept in the normal course of business. They do this because it is usually difficult to determine exactly which request is the pertinent one for given materials, and several requests may apply to a given item. Therefore, not only would reorganizing the files be a great deal of difficult work, it would often assist the opposing party. 3. Electronically Stored Information 1D465 With electronically stored information, an analogous issue arises regarding the form in which it is produced. The requesting party is initially permitted to specify the form or forms he desires, subject to objection by the responding party. In the event of a dispute, the court is likely to focus on whether a proposed form for production is reasonably usable. Fed. R. Sif. P. 34B2E. K. Failure to respond 1T466. Failure to respond to a request for inspection is a ground for a motion to compel discovery. Failure to comply with an order compelling discovery exposes the non-responding party to sanctions including the striking of portions of pleadings and a determination of facts on the assumption that inspection would have provided the requesting party with persuasive evidence. i. Materials in possession of non-parties. 1. Subpoena for inspection 1 in 467. Under federal practice, a subpoena can order a non-party to permit inspection and copying of documents in its control or to permit inspection of premises. Fed. R. Civ. P. 45A1C Some states have similar provisions. C. E.G. N.Y. Civ. Prac. Law 31 201I. A. But note. Other states require a showing of good cause in an affidavit, usually a showing of relevance to the claims or defenses raised in the action, as a condition to issuance of a subpoena. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 1985b. 2. Independent action, 1E468. Alternatively, real evidence, not otherwise discoverable, may be examined through an adequate suit in equity for discovery in aid of the original action. 6. Medical examinations. A. Court action required 1E469. If the physical or mental condition of a party is an issue, in federal court, a motion is necessary to require a party to submit to examination by experts in the service of other parties. 1. Distinguish state practice. In some states, prior court action is not required for the defendant to obtain a physical examination of the plaintiff in a personal injury suit. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 203220 b b. Condition must be an issue 1 e 470. The condition that is the subject of the examination must be raised directly by the pleadings or by the factual contentions of the parties through discovery, and the court-ordered examination must be limited to such conditions. Schlegenhoff v. Holder, 379 U.S., 104, 1964. C. Good Cause 1471. If court action is required, an examination will not be ordered except upon a showing of good cause. Fed. R. Civ. P. 35A2. Cal. Civ. Proc. 2032 a In this context, good cause means that the examination sought must be shown to be reasonably likely to produce information about the condition in issue. D. Only parties subject to examination 1 in 472. Court rules generally provide for the examination only of parties or persons in the custody or control of parties. Fed. R. Civ. P. 35A1 Some states also provide for the examination of agents of parties. C. E.G. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2032 20A. E. Qualifications of Examiner. Wummy Ford at 73. Historically, court ordered examinations were done only by medical doctors. In federal court, however, examinations may be ordered by any 
suitably licensed or certified examiner. Fed. R. Civ. P. 3501. And C. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 203220 b Licensed Physician or Other Appropriate Licensed Health Care Practitioner. 1. Selected by Party 184-74. Ordinarily, the courts will order examination by the examiner selected by the party wanting the examination. But if reasonable objection is made to the moving party's selection, the court has the power to appoint an impartial examiner of its own choosing. F. Place of Examination 1475. The examination ordinarily will be ordered at the place selected by the examining party. But the court can have the examination conducted elsewhere to diminish the burden on the examinee. G. Types of Procedure 1476. If the information sought to be obtained is important, the court may permit an examination procedure that is novel or even uncomfortable, as long as it is reasonably safe. H. Presence of counsel or other observer 1477. Federal and state courts follow widely different approaches when it comes to allowing the presence of counsel or an observer at a physical or mental examination. A majority of federal courts do not permit the presence of the examinee's counsel, a third party, or an unattended videotape machine at a physical or mental examination, absent some compelling circumstance. C. E. G. Holland v. United States, 182 FRD, 493 DSC, 1998 other courts, however, have found a right to the presence of an observer, and still others decide on a case-by-case -case basis. C. Galliade v. State Farm Mutual Automobile Insurance Co., 154 FRD, 262 D. Colo, 1994. I. Copies of Reports. 1. Examinee's right to receive copy 1D478. Upon request, the examinee has the right to receive a copy of the examiner's report. Fed. R. Civ. P. 35B1. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 230610. 2. Waiver of Privilege 1D479. However, an examinee who requests a copy of the report waives the doctor-patient privilege with respect to any previous examinations of the same condition by his own physician fed. R. Civ. P. 35B4. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code to me 32630. Any reports of such other examinations must be provided on request to the examining party. Note that even absent such a request, a plaintiff in a personal injury case waives the privilege in regard to medical examinations of the injury for which recovery is sought. 7. Duty to Supplement Responses a. Federal Practice Broad Duty to Supplement 1480 Rule 26E requires supplementation of prior responses. If in some material respect Rule 26A disclosures or discovery responses are incomplete or incorrect, or if there is additional or corrective information that has been acquired since the response was made. 1. Inapplicable if information otherwise made known 1481. The obligation to supplement is satisfied if the additional or corrective information has otherwise been made known during the discovery process or if it is supplied in writing. 2. Application to Deposition Testimony 1E482 the supplementation requirement ordinarily does not apply to deposition answers, but it is applicable to testimony of an expert witness. b. State practice, compared 1483. Some states have supplementation requirements similar to those in the federal rules, but many do not. In such states, cautious practitioners must attempt to obtain the same information by sending out supplemental interrogatories before the trial. Still other states use different procedures for the same purpose. 1. Pretrial Conference Orders 1 in 484 If a pretrial conference is held, the court on a showing of good cause may require either side to update its responses to earlier interrogatories, particularly in connection with disclosing expert witnesses who will be called to testify at trial. 
A party failing to disclose an expert at this point may be barred from using that person as a witness at trial, except on such terms as the court finds appropriate. Sanders v. Superior Court, 34 Cal, App, 3D 270 1973, Crumpton v. Dickstein, 82 Cal, App, 3D 166 1978. 2. Demand to exchange lists of expert witnesses, 1 in 485. California has a separate procedure whereby, at the time a case is set for trial, either side may serve the other with a demand to exchange information on the identity, qualifications, and expected testimony of expert witnesses. Failure to disclose the information demanded bars the use of such experts at trial, except for purposes of impeachment or on terms as the court may order. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2034 C. Scope of Discovery 1. Relation of Discovery to Proof 1486 Generally, discovery may inquire into all information, not otherwise privileged that is relevant to the claim or defense of a party, whether or not the material would be admissible as proof. It is sufficient if the information sought appears reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. Fed. R. Civ. 26B1, Cal, Civ, Proc, Code 201710. However, a few jurisdictions retain the old equity practice, under which discovery is limited to admissible evidence needed by the discovering party to bear his burden of proof. Moreover, the federal courts have become increasingly uneasy with broad discovery and have moved to limit it. A. Scope of Discovery in Federal Court, 1D487. In 2000, the Supreme Court promulgated an amendment to Rule 26b-1, defining the scope of discovery. Under the amendment, party-controlled discovery is available only with regard to matter relevant to any party's claim or defense. 1. Uncertain Dividing Line 1 in 488 Before the amendment, Rule 26b-1 allowed discovery of material relevant to the subject matter of the litigation. The committee note accompanying the amendment recognizes that the dividing line between material relevant to the subject matter of the litigation and that relevant to the claims or defenses cannot be defined with precision. But the note explains that the change is intended to signify to parties that they are not entitled to use discovery to develop new claims or defenses that are not already identified in the pleadings. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26B1 Committee Note 2. Court may expand 1489. Note that under the amended rule, the court is authorized to expand discovery to any information relevant to the subject matter of the action, if good cause is shown. 3. Case-by-case -case determination 1490. A determination of whether information is relevant to the claim or defense of any party depends on the facts of each case and types of information that are not directly pertinent to the incident in suit could be relevant to the claims or defenses. Example, other incidents of the same type, or involving the same product, could be properly discoverable under the revised standard. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26B1 Committee Note. Example, information about organizational arrangements or filing systems of a party could be discoverable if likely to yield or lead to the discovery of admissible information. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26B1 Committee Note. Example. Information that could be used to impeach a likely witness, although not otherwise relevant to the claims or defenses, might be properly discoverable. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26B1 Committee Note. B. Judicial Limitation of Disproportionate Discovery, 1D491. In federal court, the court must limit discovery if it finds one of the following circumstances to exist Fed. R. Civ. P. 26B2C. 1. Discovery Unreasonably Cumulative, 1D492. If the discovery is unreasonably cumulative or duplicative, or if it is obtainable from some other source, that is more convenient, 
less burdensome, or less expensive. The court may limit or forbid the discovery. 2. Party has already had opportunity for discovery woman 4-93. If the party seeking discovery has already had ample opportunity in the action to obtain discovery of the information sought, the court may limit or forbid the discovery. 3. Discovery unduly burdensome 1-4-94. to If the discovery is unduly burdensome or expensive in view of the needs of the case, the amount in controversy, the limitations on the party's resources, and the importance of the issues at stake in litigation, the court may limit or forbid the discovery. Criticism. This authority appears to permit the judge to truncate discovery in cases she does not think are important. This is probably not what the drafters of the rules changes had in mind. 2. Scope of relevant material. A. Meaning of relevance 1 in 4 to 95. Information will be deemed relevant and therefore may be discoverable if the information tends to prove or disprove a given proposition. In federal court, relevant evidence means evidence having any tendency to make the existence of any fact that is of consequence to the determination of the action more probable or less probable than it would be without the evidence. Fed. R. Evid. 401. For more detail, see Evidence Summary. 1. Fact of Consequence 1 in 496. The concept of a fact of consequence includes all matters that are pertinent to the decision of the case. This would include all issues raised by the pleadings. 2. Low threshold for relevance 1 in 497. The federal standard creates a very low threshold for relevance. 3. Common sense determination 1 in 498. The determination of whether evidence is relevant depends on a common-sense examination of the probative impact of the information in question on the issue it is said to bear upon. 4. Distinguish substantial evidence 1e499. A party with the burden of proof on an issue has the obligation on that issue to produce substantial evidence to justify submitting the issue to the trier of fact. See Infra, 1934 regarding burden to produce evidence. The fact that such a party has some relevant evidence on the issue does not mean that she has satisfied the burden of production. Put differently, evidence may be relevant, but by itself insufficient to support a jury verdict on a given issue. b. Relation to claims and defenses 1d500. Although the scope of discovery has narrowed, it is clear that discovery may relate to the claims or defenses of either party and is not limited to information that the discovering party needs to satisfy his own burden of proof. 1. Comment. This enables each party to evaluate his adversary's case, as well as his own. This in turn may lead to earlier and more realistic settlement efforts, which is one of the main purposes of discovery. c. Matters not in dispute 1e501. E information may be subject to discovery even though it bears on issues that are not in dispute. Again, the test is relevancy to the claims and defenses, rather than admissibility at trial. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26B1. D. Information about witnesses 1T502. The identity and location of witnesses are discoverable facts. Likewise, information bearing on the credibility of witnesses e.g. possible grounds for impeachment may be discovered. e. Insurance coverage, 1503. Although not admissible as evidence, the existence and scope of insurance coverage is discoverable in most jurisdictions. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26A1A. Latin V. Superior Court. 167 Cal. App. 2D 391 1959 Rationale Settlement negotiations are an essential part of the action, and insurance coverage is relevant at least to this aspect of the claims. F. Financial status 1504 Financial condition generally is not relevant, even though the information might affect settlement negotiations. 1. Defendant's financial status 1D505 a general inquiry into the financial ability of the defendant to satisfy a judgment usually is not permitted. However, 
The defendant's financial condition may be pertinent in some cases, as where punitive damages are sought. In such cases, the defendant may be required to disclose her financial condition. 2. Plaintiff's Financial Status 1E506 If the plaintiff's loss of earnings is in question, he may be compelled to produce copies of his financial records, including federal income tax returns. 3. Bank records 1E507. If pertinent, bank records may be subject to subpoena. Although the bank may be under a duty to notify its customer before complying, in order to give the customer an opportunity to resist disclosure. Valley Bank v. Superior Court, 15 Cal, 3D 652, 1975. G. Contentions 1508. A party may be asked to particularize his contentions as to the facts or the application of law to facts for the purpose of narrowing the issues at trial. However, answers to such questions may be delayed by court order until pretrial, when the party can be expected to know with some precision what his contentions are. 3. Privilege 1T509 Privileged material is universally excluded from obligatory disclosure through discovery. Most civil procedure courses do not examine any privilege in detail, except the attorney-client privilege, which will be the main focus here. It is the oldest and most frequently invoked privilege. A. Reasons for the Privilege 1T510 The traditional rationale for the attorney-client privilege has been labeled the utilitarian rationale. It justifies the privilege on the ground that it is necessary to promote full and frank disclosure to the lawyer by the client. Unfortunately, there is little evidence that the existence of the privilege is necessary, or perhaps even important, to achieve that objective. Accordingly, some authorities have argued that the privilege is necessary to protect the personal autonomy of persons faced with legal proceedings, because it ensures that there is at least one knowledgeable person from whom they can seek help with the assurance that this person will not become a witness for the other side. See Evidence Summary B. Requirements 1. Legal Advice, Sought 1D511 the privilege applies only to communications in which legal advice is sought. Thus, where the client is seeking business advice, no protection exists. 2. From Lawyer 1D512 The privilege applies only to communications seeking legal advice from a professional legal advisor acting in that capacity. In most jurisdictions, it applies whenever the client reasonably believes that the person from whom he seeks advice is a lawyer, even if the belief turns out to be wrong. 3. Communications relating to legal advice 1D513 The privilege applies only to communications relating to obtaining legal advice. Communications on entirely different subjects are not protected. 4. Made in confidence 1D514 the privilege applies only to communications made in confidence. In general, this means that the parties must behave as though they intend the communication to be confidential. A. Presence of other people 1E515 The presence of other people during the communication may indicate that the communication is not confidential, unless the presence of these people is necessary to the communication. Thus, the lawyer's secretary might be present to assist the lawyer. Similarly, a friend or close relative might properly be present if the client is unusually young or old or otherwise in need of moral support or guidance. b. Eavesdroppers 1D516 If the communication is overheard by an eavesdropper, the privilege usually is held not to preclude testimony by that eavesdropper, even if reasonable precautions were taken to protect confidentiality. However, if electronic surveillance was used by the eavesdropper, most courts will forbid use of the fruits of the eavesdropping. 5. By Client 1517 The traditional formulation of the privilege was that the privilege protected only information communicated to the lawyer by the client. There was no need to protect the information communicated to the client by the lawyer. It was thought except to the extent that it revealed the content of communications to the lawyer by the client. 
However, it was often difficult to distinguish communications by the lawyer that revealed client communications from others, and this limitation threatened to intrude into the relationship between the lawyer and the client. A. Modern View 1D518 The modern view is increasingly that communications by the lawyer to the client are protected also. C. E.G. Upjohn Co. V. United States. 449 U.S. 383-1981 privilege exists to protect the giving of professional advice. B. Distinguish communication by lawyer with others 1E519. When the lawyer communicates with persons other than the client, such as witnesses, the privilege does not apply. Hickman v. Taylor, 329 U.S. 495-1947 interviews with witnesses. C. Permanently protected at client's request. 1. Need to invoke 1D520. The privilege is not self-executing and applies only when invoked. Usually, however, the lawyer is under a duty to invoke the privilege on behalf of the client. 2. Absolute protection 1E521. The protection is absolute in the sense that it cannot be outweighed by other considerations such as the social interest in full disclosure of relevant evidence in the case. 3. Applies to disclosure by client or lawyer 1522. Once invoked, the privilege precludes disclosure by the lawyer and the client including employees of the client covered by the privilege. See Infra 1532 regarding corporate clients. Thus, the privilege can preclude disclosure by a person who is willing to reveal privileged information. 4. Request for return of allegedly privileged information, 1D5 and 23. When information subject to a claim of privilege or work product protection is produced in federal court discovery, the holder of the privilege may notify any party that received the information of the claim of privilege. No other party may use the information unless the court rules that the privilege claim was unjustified or that the privilege was waived. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26B5B. D. Waiver 1-5-24. Just as the client must invoke the privilege, so can the client waive it. 1. Breadth of Waiver 1-525. In general, waiver of the privilege applies to all communications with counsel on the subject matter regarding which the waiver has occurred. Rationale If the waiver did not apply to all related communications, the client could pick and choose the favorable pieces of information for revelation while keeping secret unfavorable pieces of information that are necessary to make the picture whole. 2. No need for intentional waiver 1E5 and 26. The act that constitutes a waiver need not be intentional. And in litigation, unintentional disclosure of privileged material often works a waiver of the privilege. 3. Application in other litigation, 1D5 and 27. Once the privilege is waived, it cannot be revived for other litigation. E. Federal vs. State Law. 1. Federal Claim or Defense, 1D528. In federal court, the privileges available are to be determined by principles of common law as they may be interpreted by the courts of the United States. Fed. R. Evid. 501 Thus, the federal courts may alter the rules governing federal privilege law. 2. State law claim or defense 1 in 5 or 29. In federal court, when state law supplies the rule of decision with respect to an element of a claim or defense, however, privilege issues are to be determined in accordance with state law. Fed. R. Evid. 501. F. Corporate Clients. 1. Privilege Applicable 1T530. The Supreme Court early held that the attorney-client privilege applied to corporate clients. This did not answer the question, however, of who was the client. 2. Control Group Test 1T531. Many courts limited the privilege to communications between the lawyer and those persons who could be considered the control group of the corporation, i.e., the persons who controlled the corporation and who could act on the lawyer's advice. 
But this was imperfect because often the members of the control group did not have the information the lawyer needed to evaluate the corporation's legal problems, and the lawyer would then be subjected to a Hobson's choice about whether to inquire of other employees of the corporation. 3. Upjohn Test 1532 In Upjohn Co. v. United States Supra, 1518, the Supreme Court rejected the control group test as a matter of federal common law of evidence. See Supra, 1528. Instead, the court adopted a test that can extend the privilege to any employee. Although the contours of the test are unclear, it turns basically on the following factors. A. Matters within scope of employment, 1533. The protection extends only to communication about matters within the scope of the employee's job with the corporation. B. Information, not available from higher management, 1534. The protection is justified for non-control group employees when higher management cannot itself supply the information. C. Other requirements satisfied 1535. In the course of its opinion, the court emphasized the importance of other requirements of the privilege. Thus, the employee must know that the communication is designed to obtain legal advice for the corporation and that it is to be held in confidence. D. Criticism This new formulation appears to overextend the privilege in that it provides no safeguards for the employee who makes full disclosure to the corporation's lawyer. The corporation can waive the privilege and disclose the employee's confidences without the permission of the employee. 4. State Law 1D536 At least some states have refused to follow the Supreme Court's expansion of privilege protection for corporate clients. Illinois, for example, has continued to adhere to the control group test. See Consolidation Coal Co. v. Busiris Erie Co. 432 NE2D 250 L. 1982. G. Other Communicational Privileges, 1537. Other Privileges Protect Other Communications from Disclosure. For more information on these, see the evidence summary. 1. Spousal Communications, 1538. Confidential communications between husband and wife during the marriage are privileged at the request of either spouse. Cal. Evid. Code 980. A. Distinguished testimony against spouse, 1E539. A husband or wife also has the privilege not to testify against the other spouse on any subject. Cal. Evid. Code 970-972. Trammell v. United States. 445 U.S. 40-1980 Note that no similar privilege is extended to other relatives, such as parents and children of a litigant. 2. Dr. Patient 1540. A patient usually has a limited right to prevent disclosure of information she disclosed to her doctor in connection with medical treatment. Cal. Evitt. Code 991007. A. Easily waived 1541. This privilege is easily waived and is usually held waived by a plaintiff who sues for personal injuries and thereby puts her medical condition in issue. Cal. Evid. Code 996. 3. Psychotherapist Patient 1542. The Supreme Court has held that there is a psychotherapist patient privilege for confidential communications, even if the psychotherapist is not a doctor. Jaffe v. Redmond. 518 U.S. 1996 Psychotherapy Sessions by Licensed Social Worker Privileged. 4. Priest Penitent 1543. A priest is privileged to refuse to disclose information revealed by a penitent. Cal. Evid. Code 131034. 5. Distinguished Tenure Review Materials 1544. The Supreme Court has held that universities have no privilege against disclosure of confidential tenure review materials. University of Pennsylvania v. EOC. 493 U.S. 182-1990. H. Specificity of Privilege Claim, 1545. 
If a party withholds information, particularly documents from discovery on grounds of privilege, it should describe the materials withheld with sufficient specificity to enable other parties to assess the applicability of the privilege. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26B5A. 4. Trial Preparation Materials. A. Work Product Hickman v. Taylor Rule. 1. Qualified Privilege 1D546. Materials prepared and information developed by or under the direction of a party or her attorney in anticipation of litigation are subject to discovery only if the discovering party can show a substantial need and an inability to obtain equivalent material by other means. Hickman v. Taylor, Supra, 1D519, Fed, R. Civ. P. 26B3A, Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2030. 2. Purpose 1E547. This qualified privilege is designed to maintain the adversary process by enabling each party to prepare her own case, with free reign to develop her own theory of the case and her own trial strategy. But this purpose must be reconciled with the overriding need to require full disclosure of the facts. 3. Matters Protected 1D548 The focus of this protection is on the process of preparing for litigation. Thus, it is very broad. The Federal Rule Fed. R. Civ. P. 26B3. A. Covers any materials prepared in anticipation of litigation or for trial. A. Possibility of litigation foreseen 1D549. If there is absolutely no foreseeable possibility of litigation at the time the materials are prepared, then the protection cannot apply. b. Regular Reports 1E550 When a party makes regular reports of incidents that often lead to litigation e.g. accidents, it may be held that such reports are not prepared in anticipation of litigation, since they can be used for other purposes and are prepared in situations in which litigation is not foreseen. c. e.g. Rackus v. Erie Lackawanna Railroad 76 FRD, 145 WDNY, 1977 Employees Accident Reports to Claims Department are Discoverable. 4. Showing to Justify Disclosure 1E551 To obtain production of material that is protected as work product, a party must make a showing of substantial need and undue hardship. A. Substantial Need 1E552 the party must show that the material sought is of substantial importance to its case. Courts usually do not treat minimal relevance as sufficient. b. Inability to obtain equivalent 1D 553. The party must also show that it is unable to obtain the substantial equivalent without undue hardship. 5. Special protection for mental impressions of attorney 1D 554. If a showing has been made to justify disclosure, materials containing the mental impressions of an attorney are given special protection. Example, a memorandum prepared by an attorney may include her observations at the scene of the accident, which would be ordinary work product. The memo could also include the attorney's theories about possible grounds of liability and promising avenues of investigation as well as her assessments of the persuasiveness of various possible witnesses. All this material, except her observations at the scene, would be considered opinion work product and would receive special protection. a. Protection under Federal Rules 1E555 Federal Rule 26B3B states that in ordering discovery of work product, the court must protect against disclosure of the mental impressions and legal theories of an attorney. This rule has been held to provide absolute protection to such items. Duplin Corp. v. Moulinage et Retortory de Chavanaz, 509 F2D 734th Sir, 1974, Cert. Denied, 420 U.S. 1997-1975 The Supreme Court, however, has declined to take this step. We are not prepared at this juncture to say that such material is always protected by the work product rule. Upjohn Co. v. United States, Supra, 
1T518 and several lower courts have denied absolute protection. C. E.G. Holmgren v. State Farm Mutual Automobile Insurance Co. 976 F2D 573 9th Sir. 1992 Lawyers' Mental Impressions A Pivotal Issue and Need for Their Disclosure Compelling. B. State Law 1D 556. Under the law of some states, protection for such materials is absolute. C. E.G. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2030 A. A writing that reflects an attorney's impressions, conclusions, opinions, or legal research or theories is not discoverable under any circumstances. C. Method Redaction 1E557. If materials containing opinion work product are ordered produced, the portions containing the opinion work product may be redacted by covering them over in the copying process so they cannot be read. Six. Rule 26b-3 and Hickman contrasted 1T558. In federal court, the protections of Rule 26b-3 and Hickman both continue to apply, although usually they overlap. There are significant differences, however. A. Trial preparation by non-lawyers 1E559. Hickman protects only the work of lawyers. It applies to their assistance and perhaps to experts hired by them or others acting at their direction. Rule 26b3a is broader. It also includes trial preparation by the parties, consultant, surety, indemnitor, insurer, or agent. b. Tangible materials 1 in 560. Rule 26b3a is more limited than Hickman, however, in protecting only documents and tangible things. It therefore has no application, for example, to a deposition of the attorney, inquiring into her trial strategies, etc. Hickman would apply in such a situation, however, since it is not limited to tangible items. 7. Protection after litigation terminated 1D561. It is not entirely clear whether work product protection endures after termination of the litigation for which the material was prepared. The Supreme Court has held in a case involving the Freedom of Information Act that the protection continues. FTCV, Grolier, Inc., 462 U.S., 1983, it has also been held that the protection can apply in a case that was not anticipated at the time the material was prepared, as long as it was prepared in anticipation of some litigation. Duplin Corp. v. Moulinage et Retortory de Chavanaz, Supra, 1555. 8. Distinguish attorney client privilege, 1562. The qualified work product rule must be distinguished from the absolute privilege, afforded confidential communications from client to counsel. 9. Witness statements, 1563. Because witness statements illustrate the application of work product and the attorney client privilege. It is worthwhile to examine them in detail. Some statements of witnesses to lawyers may be subject to the attorney client privilege, while other communications made to lawyers or investigators may be treated as work product and thus be subject to disclosure only on a showing of substantial need. A. Statements made by party to own attorney 1D564. If the statements were made in confidence regarding past events, the communications are privileged under the attorney-client privilege. 1. Attorney's Employees 1 in 565 The privilege may also apply to statements made to an investigator employed by the party's counsel. Brackage v. Graf. 206 NW2D 45 Neb. 1973. 2. Caveat 1D 566 Note, however, that a party cannot put documents beyond the reach of discovery by turning them over to counsel. Nor can a party relieve himself of the obligation to disclose by making disclosure to his own lawyer. All that is protected is the fact of communication from client to lawyer. b. Statements by employees of corporation 1E567 The attorney-client privilege applies to communications made in confidence by employees of a corporation 
including non-supervisory employees in many jurisdictions. See Supra, 1D 532-1535. 1. Confidential Reports 1E568. The attorney-client privilege may also apply to routine reports that are intended to be confidential records of the corporation, prepared for the corporation's attorney, e.g. accident reports prepared by a truck driver according to company policy that such reports be submitted immediately following any accident for confidential use of the corporation's lawyers. D.I. Chadbourne, Inc. V. Superior Court, 60 Cal. 2D 723 1964. 2. Other Reports 1E569 Other reports of employees to corporate counsel are not covered by the attorney-client privilege, but may be subject to the qualified work product privilege if they were made or prepared in anticipation of litigation. Xerox v. IBM 64 FRD 367 SDNY 1974 however, remember that regular reports may be found to not meet the in-anticipation requirement. C. Supra, 1D 550. C. Statements of non-party witnesses, 1D 570. Statements obtained from non-party witnesses are usually held to be work product of the attorney, so they are not subject to discovery by an adversary, unless he is not reasonably able to obtain a similar statement from the witness by his own effort. 1. Note. Under federal practice, the witness himself is entitled to a copy of his statement as a matter of right. Fed. R. Sip. P. 26B3C. 2. Not covered by attorney-client privilege. Witness interviews are not covered by the attorney-client privilege. Hickman v. Taylor, Supra. 1519. D. Statements made by party to adverse counsel 1571. Usually, no privilege absolute or qualified protects statements of a party made to adverse counsel. Such statements are subject to discovery without a showing of need i.e. A party witness is entitled to a copy of statements given to adverse counsel as a matter of right. Fed. R. Sif. P. 26B3C. B. Expert Reports 1572. Lawyers are increasingly dependent on retained experts to help them prepare for trials and to testify at trials. Often the subject matter of a litigation is unfamiliar to the lawyer, and the lawyer therefore needs the assistance of a person schooled in the field to prepare adequately for trial. At trial, the technical subject matter of the litigation may make it essential that an expert testify to support the party's case. For more detail on the rules governing the presentation of expert testimony at trial, see the evidence summary. 1. Non-testifying experts. A. Role 1T573. When the lawyer needs the help of an expert to prepare for trial, she will often retain one to advise her on trial strategy and help develop legal and factual theories for the case. The expert can also help the lawyer prepare to cross-examine the opponent's expert. b. Discoverability of facts known and opinions, held 1574. Under Federal Rule 26b-4b, facts known to and opinions held by non-testifying experts are discoverable only in exceptional circumstances, e.g., when one party has monopolized the qualified experts. Rationale Allowing discovery would give the party seeking it a free ride where it could hire its own expert. 1. Reimbursement for fees 1 in 575. Where discovery is ordered, the court is to require the discovering party to reimburse the party who retained the expert for a fair portion of the fees and expenses paid for the facts and opinions developed by the expert. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26B4CI. C. Non-testifying expert as witness for opponent 1E576. Experts can differ in their opinions, and when a lawyer hires an expert, she will not always know the expert's opinion of her client's case. What happens if the expert develops an opinion unfavorable to the client? The opposing side will likely want to hire the expert because the circumstances tend to make her opinion very believable.
At least one court has held that the opposing party may not do so in the absence of extraordinary circumstances, i.e., Rule 26b4b Supra. 1574 must be satisfied Durflinger v. R. Tiles, 727 F2D 888 10th Sir. 1984. But other courts might not adopt this rule. The rationale is that if such use of the non-testifying experts' opinions were allowed, lawyers might be deterred from consulting experts whose opinions are unknown. d. Discovery of Identity of Non-Testifying Expert, 1577. The courts are split on whether the identity of the non-testifying expert can be discovered. Compare Ager v. Jane C. Stormont Hospital, 622 F2D 496 10th Sir. 1980 Discovery Not Permitted because it subverts protective purposes of the rule with Backy v. B.F. Diamond Construction Co. 71. F.R.D. 179 D. M.D. 1976 Discovery Allowed, because it does not involve disclosure of facts known or opinions held by expert. E. Informally Consulted Experts, 1D578. The protections of Rule 26b4b apply only to experts who are retained or specially employed by a party. The courts have held that discovery regarding experts who were only informally consulted is not available. Proctor and Gamble Co. v. Hodgen, 184 FRD, 410 D, Utah 1999. 2. Testifying Experts 1 in 579. The federal rules allow broad discovery regarding testifying experts and impose a requirement to provide a written report that applies to most such experts. A. Required Disclosure 1580 Without a formal discovery request, each party must identify each person that party will call to offer expert testimony at trial. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26A2A. B. Timing of Disclosure 1D581 in the absence of other direction from the court. This disclosure must be made at least 90 days before trial. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26A2C However, courts may stagger the disclosures, and the party with the burden of proof may be required to disclose first. 1. Rebuttal 1582. Within 30 days after the disclosure by an opposing party, a party may add another expert intended to offer testimony solely to rebut or contradict expert evidence identified by the opposing party. c. Required report by expert witness 1 in 583. In addition to identifying its expert witnesses, a party must ordinarily provide a detailed report from the expert. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26A 2B. 1. Experts covered 1D584. A report must be prepared for any specially retained expert and for any employee of a party whose duties regularly include giving expert testimony. This ordinarily does not include a party's treating doctor if the doctor will offer opinions only on the basis of observations during treatment. Riddick v. Washington Hospital Center, 183 FRD, 327 DDC. 1998. 2. Signed by Expert 1 in 585. The report is to be signed by the witness, although it is contemplated that counsel may assist in drafting the report. 3. Statement of Experts' Opinions 1 in 586. The report is to include a complete statement of all opinions the expert will express in testimony, along with the basis therefore and the data or other information on which they are based. This makes all materials provided the expert, including privileged materials, subject to mandatory disclosure. 4. Exhibits 1587. Disclosure should also include all exhibits that will be used in connection with the testimony. 5. Experts' Qualifications 1588. The report must include the witness's qualifications including all publications during the preceding 10 years and a list of all cases in which the expert testified during the preceding four years. 6. Experts' Compensation 1589 
The report should include the compensation the expert will be paid. 7. Supplementation 1590. The report should be supplemented with new information that is developed after it is submitted. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26E2. D. Deposition of Right 1591. Any party has a right to take the deposition of a testifying expert. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26B4A where a report is required. However, this deposition may not take place until after the report is provided. 1. Supplementation of Experts Testimony, 1592. Although supplementation is not required with other deposition testimony, a party has a duty to supplement the deposition testimony of its expert witness. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26 E2. 2. Compensation of Expert for Responding to Discovery 1D593 The party taking the deposition must compensate the expert for the time spent on the deposition. Compare. There is no requirement to compensate the expert for the time spent on the report. E. State Practice Compared 1D594 States often have similar statutory procedures for pretrial identification of expert witnesses including provisions for pretrial depositions. C. E.G. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 234260. 3. Unaffiliated Experts 1 on 595. Rule 26b4 makes no provision for a person who has expertise that may be pertinent to a lawsuit, but who has not consented to assist any party in connection with a case. On occasion, Litigants subpoena such persons to compel them to testify. It has been held that they may sometimes be compelled to give such testimony, albeit perhaps only on being paid a fee for it. C. E.G. Wright v. Jeep Corp. 547 F2D 871 E.D. Mitch. 1982 Professor who prepared report on Jeep rollover problems compelled to testify. A. Rationale. Experts should be treated like other witnesses who have information that is pertinent to the resolution of a lawsuit. b. Criticism Society pays a price if such experts are required to spend substantial time attending depositions or trials, and they may not be adequately compensated for being required to reveal their expertise. c. Protection against subpoenas 1 in 596 Rule 45 provides that if a subpoena requires disclosing an unretained expert's opinion or information that does not describe specific occurrences in dispute and results from the expert's study that were not requested by a party, the court may quash or modify the subpoena. Alternatively, if the party in whose behalf the subpoena is issued shows a substantial need for the testimony or material that cannot be otherwise met without undue hardship, and assures that the person to whom the subpoena is addressed will be reasonably compensated. The court may order appearance or production only upon specified conditions. Fed. R. Civit. P. 45 C. 3 C. D. Distinguish expert as fact witness 1 in 597. Whether or not experts should be protected against being compelled to testify regarding matters within their expertise. They are not immune to the civic duty to testify regarding the facts of the case. Thus, if a Nobel Prize winner witnesses an accident, she must testify about what she saw just like any other witness. D. Protective Orders 1. Introduction 1 in 598 Protective orders are designed to prevent undue burdens that might otherwise be imposed by discovery. The availability of protective orders recognizes both that discovery can be extremely intrusive and that parties may seek to abuse it. Both concerns can be ameliorated through protective provisions. 2. Requirement of Good Cause 1D599 A protective order should be granted only on a showing of good cause by the party seeking protection. Fed. R. Civ. P. 26C1 Appropriate Grounds Include the Following. A. Confidential Information 1 in 600 A protective order may be entered to protect trade secret or other confidential research, development, or commercial information. Fed. 
R. Sif. P. 26 C 1 G. 1. Showing required. A. Confidentiality 1 in 601. Such protection is available only for information that is in fact confidential. To justify an order, the party must show that the information has been held in confidence. b. Specific harm from disclosure 1d602. There must also be a showing that a specific harm is likely to flow from disclosure of the information. c. Not limited to technical information 1d603. The protection is not limited to technical trade secret information, but rather may extend to wide varieties of commercial data whose disclosure could give commercial advantage to competitors. It has therefore been applied to customer lists Chesa International Limited v. Fashion Associates, Inc. 425 F. Sup. 234 SDNY. 1977. Profit and Gross Income Data Corbett v. Free Press Association. 50 FRD. 179 D. BT. 1970. In terms of a contract Essex Wire Corp. V. Eastern Electric Sales Co. 48 FRD. 308 ED. PA. 1969. D. Privacy Interests. 1 in 604. Related arguments can be made to justify the protection of privacy interests of litigants, because Rule 26 C1 allows protection against annoyance or embarrassment. C. E.G. Galella V. Onassis. Supra. 1 in 344. Jacqueline Onassis protected against being photographed by plaintiff during her deposition. 2. Stipulated Orders 1 in 605 Despite the showing requirement, confidentiality orders are often entered into on stipulation. In such situations, there are no findings regarding either confidentiality or the risk of harm to any person. Caution. Some courts question the propriety of such orders. 3. Format Umbrella Orders 1D606 Protective orders to protect confidentiality can take a number of forms. One would be to forbid discovery altogether. More often, however, the information is validly sought for trial preparation, and the court places limitations on use and dissemination of the confidential information. Because these orders often are self-executing and apply throughout the discovery process, they are referred to as umbrella orders. A. Designation of confidential information 1E607. Usually, any person producing information is allowed to designate it as confidential and, therefore, subject to the protection of the order. Often this is done by stamping documents confidential. 1. No judicial scrutiny 1E608. Note that there is no judicial involvement in the designation process, which is left entirely to the parties. b. Effect of designation 1D609 Usually, all designated documents are to be held in confidence by the other parties, used only for trial preparation, and disclosed only to specified persons, usually including the client and witnesses. c. Challenges to designation 1D610 any party may move the court to set aside a confidentiality designation on the ground that the material is not in fact confidential. 1. Burden on producing party 1 in 611. At this point, the burden is on the producing party to establish that the material is indeed entitled to protection under Rule 26C. 2. Exception blanket challenges 1 in 612. In some cases where large volumes of material have been designated confidential, however, the court may impose on the challenging party the duty to specify which confidentiality designations are challenged and why. C. E.G. Zenith Radio Corp. V. Matsushita Electric Industrial Co. 529 F. Sup. 866 E.D. Pa. 1981 after summary judgment was entered plaintiff sought to unseal hundreds of thousands of documents that had been designated confidential. 4. Public Access 1 in 613 The public may have an interest in materials covered by confidentiality orders. Were the material to be offered in evidence at trial, 
there would be a constitutional and common law right of public access to court trial that would enable the public to have access to the information. Before trial, there are two possible arguments. A. Discovery presumptively public wanting 614. Some courts say that discovery is presumptively public unless closed, and that orders limiting access to the public need special justification. This argument appears not to apply to material covered by proper protective orders, and the Supreme Court has stated that there is no tradition of public access to discovery. Seattle Times Co. v. Reinhardt, 467 U.S., 2019-84. 1. Filing of discovery discontinued 1615. Formerly, discovery materials were automatically filed with the court. However, filing is no longer automatic. This change may further weaken arguments that there should be some presumptive public access to discovery materials because there is no reason to expect them to be in a public file. b. Material involved in pretrial rulings, wanting 616. Where materials covered by a confidentiality order are involved in pretrial rulings by the court, the public access argument is stronger because the constitutional and common law rights are designed to allow the public meaningful access to observe judicial decision-making. The application of this concept is not always easy. 1. Access allowed decision on merits of case 1670. If pretrial rulings resolve the merits, Access to discovery materials relied on should be granted. C. E.G. Science IV. New Times Publishing Co. 88 FRD. 562 SDNY. 1980 Summary Judgment Granted. 2. Access denied decision that privileged materials should not be produced warning signal 18. If a discovery motion presents the question of whether materials sought are privileged and based on an in-camera review of the materials, the court decides that they should not be produced. Public access should not be allowed because it would undermine the privilege. 3. Intermediate Situations 1 in Sidonor 19 A problem arises in cases I not involving resolution of the merits or Roman II involving non-merits decisions that would be undermined by disclosure. Courts tend to deem all materials considered in connection with a motion to be subject to presumptive public access. C. E.G. Zenith Radio Corp. V. Matsushita Electric Industrial Co. Supra public right of access to all materials offered in good faith in connection with summary judgment motion. 5. Sharing with other litigants 1 in 620. An issue of growing importance is the possibility that materials covered by a confidentiality order could be shared with other litigants in similar cases. This would tend to reduce discovery expense for other litigants, which would be a legitimate objective. United States v. Hooker Chemical Co., 90 FRD, 421 WDNY, 1981 courts often allow such sharing. 6. First Amendment Limitations on Protective Orders, 1 means 621. Protective orders can limit expression by forbidding litigants to disclose information gained through discovery. A. Prior Restraint Analysis 1 in 622 Some courts held that such orders could be justified under the First Amendment, only where a prior restraint would be warranted, a very demanding standard. C. E.G. in Rehauken, 598 F2D 176 D.C. Sir. 1979 For more on the Prior Restraint Doctrine. C. Constitutional Law Summary. B. Supreme Court Ruling 1 in 623. The Supreme Court rejected the prior restraint analysis and held that a protective order supported by good cause is valid under the First Amendment. Seattle Times Co. v. Reinhardt, Supra, 1 in 614. C. Continuing concern about First Amendment, 1 in 624. There is disagreement in the lower courts about whether courts should continue to consider First Amendment values in deciding whether to issue or modify protective orders. Compare Cipollone v. Liggett Group, Inc., 785 F2D1A108 3D, sir. 1986 First Amendment Irrelevant with Anderson v. Cryovac, Inc., 805 F2D1 First, sir. 
1986 First Amendment still a presence in protective order decisions. b. Inconvenient place of examination. 1 625. If a deposition has been scheduled at a place that is unnecessarily inconvenient for the deponent or adversary, a protective order may issue. 1. Federal Practice 1 626. Under the federal rules, Protective orders are the only method available for controlling the place at which the deposition of a party can be scheduled, since the adverse party can notice his deposition to be taken anywhere. Compare. A non-party witness cannot be required to appear except by subpoena, and the range of a subpoena is limited. See Supra, 1-379. A. Non-resident defendants, 1-627. On applications for protective orders as to the place of deposition, courts are inclined to hold that a non-resident defendant should be deposed at his residence rather than at the place where the suit is pending. 1. But note, a contrary result may be reached if the plaintiff is willing to pay the defendant's expenses to travel to the forum, or if it is shown that the defendant will be in the forum anyway. b. Non-resident plaintiff 1 in 628. The courts appear more inclined to require a non-resident plaintiff to appear locally for his deposition, since he chose to file his action in the local forum. 2. State practice compared 1629. Instead of requiring a non-resident deponent to obtain a protective order, state rules frequently put the burden on the party seeking the deposition to obtain a prior court order if he wishes to compel the other party to give her deposition beyond the range of a subpoena. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 225260 a C. Unreasonable conduct of deposition. 1D630. If a deposition is conducted in a manner that is unduly annoying, embarrassing, or oppressive to a witness or party, a protective order may issue. When the court terminates a deposition for this reason, it may not be resumed or rescheduled, except by court order. Fed. R. Civ. P. 30D3B. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 2254 20B16. D. Unduly burdensome discovery. 1631. When discovery is unduly expensive, unnecessarily burdensome, or otherwise clearly excessive in relation to the importance of the case. A protective order may be sought to limit discovery. See Supra 1491-1494 regarding judicial limitation of discovery. 3. Relation between protective orders and other discovery orders. A. Effective prior orders 1632. Protective orders are rarely appropriate in regard to discovery conducted pursuant to a prior court order. The circumstances and limitations to be imposed on a medical examination, for example, are generally determined at the time the examination is ordered. Consequently, absent some new information or a change of circumstances, there is no occasion to reconsider the initial order. b. No waiver 1 in 633. A party or witness who does not seek a protective order in advance of a deposition or before the response date for interrogatories, does not thereby waive her right to make objections. She remains free to object to questioning at deposition, and she may refuse answers to interrogatories, thereby forcing the discovering party to invoke the power of the court to compel answers to those questions which the court deems proper. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37A. E. Failure to disclose, or to comply with discovery. 1. Order compelling response necessary prerequisite 1 in 634. Before discovery sanctions can be imposed, a party seeking discovery must usually obtain an order compelling discovery. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37A1. A. Evasive or incomplete answer 1 in 635. If a motion to compel discovery is made, an evasive or incomplete answer is treated as a failure to answer. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37A4 This means that the responding party can be ordered to provide a proper answer. B. Exception complete failure to respond 1636. 
If a party completely fails to file a response to a discovery request or to attend his properly noticed deposition, discovery sanctions can be sought immediately, without the need for a prior order compelling discovery. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37D. C. Exception failure to make required disclosures or supplementation. 1E637. If a party fails to make disclosures required by Rule 26A or to supplement disclosures and discovery responses as required by Rule 26E1, the court should usually exclude undisclosed materials from evidence, and it may also impose Rule 37B sanctions, which are usually reserved for failures to comply with discovery orders. 1. Grounds for declining to sanction nondisclosure, 1 in 638. The court should not impose sanctions on a party who has substantial justification for its failure to disclose, or when the failure to disclose was harmless. d. Need to meet and confer before motion 1 in 639. Before filing a motion to compel discovery, a party must attempt to meet and confer with the opposing party in an effort to secure compliance without court action. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37A1 D. 2. Sanctions for failure to comply with Order 1 in 640. If sanctions are authorized because of disobedience of an order compelling discovery, the court has a variety of options available. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37B2. A many of them affect the merits of the case and may therefore be called merits sanctions. A. Order Establishing Facts 1 in 641. The court may order that matters pertinent to the discovery be taken as established in the favor of the party seeking discovery. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37B2AI. B. Order Disallowing Claims or Defenses 1 in 642. The court may deny the offending party the right to present claims or defenses raised by the pleadings, or exclude certain matters from evidence. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37B2I. Example. When plaintiff failed to provide adequate answers to interrogatories regarding damages, the court precluded plaintiff from introducing evidence of damages, leaving it with only a claim for injunctive relief. Sim 42nd Street Theatre Corp. v. Allied Artists, 602 F2D 1062 2D Sir, 1979. c. Dismissal or Default 1643. The court can use the litigation death penalty and dismiss or default the offending party, rendering judgment in favor of the party seeking discovery. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37b to a Roman 6. D. Contempt 1644. The court may also impose contempt sanctions on the offending party. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37b to a v c and fra. 1659-1662. Regarding contempt. E. Discretion to select proper sanction. 1645. The trial court has substantial discretion to select the proper sanction. However, there are some guidelines in the area. 1. Least severe sanction 1 in 646. Some courts of appeals direct district judges to use the least severe sanction, but others do not. Compare Gonzalez v. Trinity Marine Group, Inc., 117 F3D 894 5th Sir. 1997 District Court abused its discretion by dismissing, because that was not the least onerous sanction that would redress plaintiff's conduct, with Angulo Alvarez v. Aponte de la Torre, 170 F3D 246 First Sir, 1999 District Court, did not abuse its discretion by dismissing without first considering less severe sanctions in any case. The District Court clearly has discretion to use less severe sanctions if it concludes that would serve the interests of justice. 2. General Deterrence 1 in 647 The Supreme Court, however, has stated that general deterrence can justify sanctions more severe than would be necessary to deter the offending party from future discovery misconduct i.e., the courts can impose a harsh sanction against this recalcitrant litigant 
in order to deter future litigants from similar misconduct. National Hockey League v. Metropolitan Hockey Club, Inc., 427 U.S., 639-1976, and C. Brockton Savings Bank v. Pete, Marwick, Mitchell & Co., 771 F2D5 First Sir. 1985 No requirement that lesser sanction first be considered. 3. Culpability necessary for sanctions. A. Due process requirements 1648. There are due process limitations on the power of a court to impose sanctions that affect the merits. 1. No merits sanctions for misconduct unrelated to merits 1649. A party has a constitutional right to have her case decided on the merits, whether or not she obeys every directive of the court. Hence, it is a violation of due process for the court to enter judgment against a party merely for disobeying an order. Hovey v. Elliott, 167 U.S. 409-1897 However, if a party's misconduct taints the merits, that is sufficient to justify a sanction order that redresses the effects of the misconduct. Thus, the failure to comply with discovery usually will support an inference that the violator's case lacks merit and justify a merit sanction. Hammond Packing Co. v. Arkansas, 212 U.S. 302299. 2. Ability to comply 1D650. Even if the failure to comply relates to the merits of the case, it would violate due process to enter judgment against a party for failing to do something that he was unable to do. Societe Internationale v. Rogers, 357 U.S. 197 1958. b. Willfulness, bad faith, or other fault winning 651. The ordinary formulation looks to whether the party to be sanctioned was guilty of willfulness, bad faith, or other fault in connection with the failure to comply with the court's order. The broadest ground is other fault, and it is unclear whether it would extend to simple negligence. C. Sin 42nd Street Theatre Corp. V. Allied Artists, Supra, 1642 Gross Negligence Sanctionable. C. Punishing Client for Lawyer's Misconduct, 1652. Often, it will not be clear that the client who is directly affected by merit sanctions was responsible for misconduct by the lawyer. 1. Lawyer as Agent of Client, 1653. The Supreme Court has said that the lawyer is the agent of the client and that the client is therefore responsible for the conduct of the lawyer. Link v. Wabash Railroad, 370 U.S., 626, 1962. 2. Need to show client involvement, 1654. Most lower courts, however, insist on some showing of client involvement before imposing harsh sanctions on the client. C. E.G. Sin 42nd Street Theater Corp. v. Allied Artists. Supra plaintiff's principal officer, intimately involved in litigation. Shivi, Donohoe Construction Co., 529 F2D 1871 3D Sir. 1986 Trial Court to provide direct warning about risk of dismissal to parties before imposing ultimate sanction. D. Loss of electronically stored information, 1655. Absent exceptional circumstances, a federal court may not impose Rule 37 sanctions for failure to produce electronically stored information that was lost due to routine, good-faith operation of an electronic information system. A preservation obligation may require a party to modify or suspend the routine operation of its information system if that operation could destroy discoverable information after it has notice of a potential claim. This is sometimes called a litigation hold and failure to use a litigation hold could show a lack of good faith. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37E. 4. Imposition of Costs of Discovery Proceedings. A. Motion to Compel Discovery 1656. Unless the court finds that the losing party on a discovery motion was substantially justified in taking the position it did, the court will require the losing party to pay the other side the cost of making or defending against the motion to compel. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37A5. 
b. Failure to obey order compelling discovery, 1 means 657. The party who fails to comply with a discovery order may, in addition to other sanctions, be required to pay the moving party the cost of seeking sanctions. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37b2c. C. For failure to attend deposition, 1 means 658. Federal Rule 30G. 1 authorizes the imposition of costs for a party's failure to attend a deposition that he's scheduled. 5. Contempt power. A. Defiance of prior court order 1 in 659. Failure to comply with a party-initiated discovery notice e.g. Failure to answer an interrogatory to a party is not in itself a basis for contempt. Contempt is an appropriate sanction only if the party or witness refuses to make disclosure in defiance of a prior court order. Example. A deponent who fails to submit to a deposition after having been ordered to do so, or who does not comply with a subpoena, may be held in contempt of court. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37b1. 45e. B. Civil Contempt 1 Dean 660. The contempt sanction may be civil and thus coercive in effect i.e., the witness may purge himself of the contempt at any time by providing the information sought. International Business Machines Corp. v. United States, 493 F2D 112 2D Sir, 1975. c. Criminal Contempt 1 Dean 661. In a flagrant case, it may also be proper to impose punishment on a contumacious witness even if he is now willing to submit. C. Gompers v. Buck Stove and Range Co. 221 U.S. Born in 1911. D. Limitation. No contempt to compel medical examination. 1 in 662. In deference to the personal rights of parties, the contempt power may not be used to compel medical examination. Fed. R. Civ. P. 37B2AV. 6. Distinguished Sanctions for Improper Certification, 1 in 663. Federal Rule 26G makes the signature of an attorney on a discovery paper a certificate with respect to the following matters, and directs that if a paper is signed in violation of this requirement, the court shall impose a sanction on the person signing the paper and or the party on whose behalf it was submitted. A. Supported by law, 1 in 664. The signature certifies that the request or response is consistent with the federal rules and warranted by existing law or a good faith argument for the extension, modification, or reversal of existing law. B. Proper purpose, 1 in 665. The signature also certifies that the request or response was not interposed for any improper purpose, such as to harass or to cause unnecessary delay or needless increase in the cost of litigation. c. Reasonable 1 Dean 666 Finally, the signature certifies that the request or response is not unreasonable or unduly burdensome or expensive, given the needs of the case, the discovery already had in the case, the amount in controversy, and the importance of the issues at stake in the litigation. f. Appellate Review of Discovery Orders 1. Orders Usually Not Appealable a. Discovery Orders Not Final 1 Dean 667 To further the interest of judicial economy, generally only final orders are appealable. Orders concerning discovery are not final judgments, and hence are not appealable in most jurisdictions. 1. Not Collateral 1 Dean 668 Despite the prohibition against appealing non-final orders, many jurisdictions allow immediate appeal of orders that are collateral i.e. not directly in issue to the main case. Discovery orders are not regarded as collateral to the main action and so are not immediately appealable under this principle. See Infra. 2197-2213 Cunningham v. Hamilton County, 527 U.S. 198-1999 Rule 37 Sanctions Orders are not collateral to the merits. b. Not Injunctions 1 in 669. Likewise, 
Discovery orders are not injunctions within the meaning of statutes authorizing immediate appeals from orders granting or denying injunctions. 28 U.S.C. 1292A International Products Corp. v. Coons, 325 F2D 4032 D. Sir. 1963. C. Appealable in some states, 1D 670. In some states, discovery orders are appealable orders, i.e., in those states, no final decision requirement is imposed as a condition of appellate jurisdiction. C. Bowser v. Uniroyal, 39 App. Div. 2D 632 1972. 2. Modes of Review. A. Certified Appeal Federal Practice, 1671. If the discovery motion raises an important question about the controlling discovery rule, the trial court may certify the question to the appellate court. If appropriate certification legislation has been enacted in the jurisdiction e.g., where the jurisdiction has adopted a statute allowing lower courts to certify important and unsettled issues to the state Supreme Court. C. E.G. American Express Warehousing Limited. V. Transamerica Insurance Co. 380 F2D 277 2D Sir. 1967. B. Mandamus or Prohibition State and Federal Practice. 1672. An extraordinary writ such as a writ of mandamus, which orders a court to perform an act, may be issued by an appellate court to correct or prevent an abuse of discretion by the trial judge in exercising power over the discovery process. 28 U.S.C. 1651. Schlagenhoff v. Holder, Supra. 1470. Greyhound Corp. v. Superior Court. 56 Cal. 2D 355 1960. One such writs usually are issued only in extraordinary situations. C. Review after judgment 1673. If the trial court fails to compel effective disclosure, the appellate court may reverse the judgment on this basis. However, the discovery ruling must be shown to have been prejudicial i.e. likely to have affected the outcome of the case, or there is little likelihood of reversal. C. Burns v. Thiocall Chemical Corp. 483 F2D 305th Sir. 1973. D. Sanction, as final wounding 674. If the discovery sanction takes the form of a final disposition, such as a judgment of dismissal or any entry of judgment by default, that judgment is final and appealable. Brennan v. Engineered Product, Inc. 506 F2D 299 8th Sir. 1974. E. Review of Contempt Order 1675. An order of civil contempt is not final and hence is not generally appealable until final judgment is entered. International Business Machines Corp. v. United States, Supra. 1660, however. A conviction of criminal contempt is final and appealable. Union Tool Co. v. Wilson. 259 U.S. 107 1922 Caution Sometimes the distinction between civil and criminal contempt is difficult to discern. See United Mine Workers v. Bagwell, 512 U.S. 8 or 21 1994 for purposes of right to jury trial. Contempt order was criminal, although court announced penalty for violation in advance. G. Use of discovery at trial. 1. Statements of adversary. A. Admissions 1676. A party's admissions, i.e., statements detrimental to his case in a deposition or in response to an interrogatory, are admissible just like any other admission. However, such admissions are not conclusive, as they may be shown to have been inadvertent. Fed. R. Civ. P. 32A1. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 225 620. 1. But note. An admission in a response to a request for admission under Federal Rule 36 is conclusive proof of the facts admitted. Fed. R. Civ. P. 36B. C. Supra. 1422-1441. B. Right to object 1677. 
The party whose statement is being used may object at trial on the basis of its irrelevance or impropriety, and is not barred by her failure to interpose objections at the time of discovery. Fed. R. Civ. P. 32b. D. 2. Statements of other witnesses. A. Prior inconsistent statement. 1678. Depositions may be admitted at trial for impeachment i.e. to prove a prior inconsistent statement of a witness who testifies at trial. Fed. R. Civ. P. 32A2. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 225620 A. B. Unavailability 1679. In addition, depositions may be admitted to prove the facts testified to at the deposition. If the deponent is unavailable at trial e.g. witness out of state, too ill to testify, deceased, etc. Fed. R. Civ. P. 32A4. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 225620 C2. C. Party's own deposition. 1680. A party may use her own deposition in lieu of personal testimony if she is unavailable for trial C above. Provided that she has not procured her own absence i.e., leaving the jurisdiction to avoid being called as a witness by the adversary. Fed. R. Civ. P. 32A4. C. Supra. 1405. H. Private Investigation. 1. Formal Discovery. Not obligatory 1681. Civil litigants are entitled to conduct their own private investigation of the facts and are not obliged to use the discovery process to secure information. IBM v. Edelstein, 526 F2D 37 2D Sir, 1975. A. Exception contact with opposing party 1682. However, ethical rules forbid a lawyer from contacting an opposing party known to be represented by counsel without the permission of that party's attorney. 2. Admissibility of proof, privately obtained 1683. Under the Fourth Amendment, the government may not use evidence in criminal trials that was obtained through improper means. Private party, however, are not subject to the Fourth Amendment limitations on searches or exclusionary rules intended to enforce such constitutional restraints. Thus, at least in the absence of egregious wrongdoing, civil litigants may use material as proof even if it was obtained by tortious means. Sackler v. Sackler, 15 NY2D 40 1964. 